Uh, good morning again. I want to say hello to my friends online today, all of you who are watching. Uh, Lori up in Seattle, I want to say hello to you and also to the Hartles out in Pennsylvania and uh, the Espinosas in Colorado. And uh, it's just so neat to get uh, little emails from people here and there of uh, Texas and uh, different places. We've received some emails recently of people that are watching. Don't know who they are, but they found us online, and uh, it's kind of neat. So uh, if you're watching today, I just want to welcome you. Um, for those of you that haven't heard, I want to take just a moment here uh, to pray for my son, Jack. Uh, last night, just about the time I was getting ready to go to bed, he was outside, just uh, right out front of our house, and he fell off his skateboard doing a trick, and his feet were planted. As he did the trick, he landed, and then the board went out, and his chin went down, and it just totally split it open, and it broke his jaw. Um, so we, our plan is... Um, we're, we're, we're kind of waiting to see what's going on. We talked to the surgeon, and until the swelling goes down, there's not much we can do at this point. And uh, so I want to lift him up in prayer. And I see that he just walked in. And, uh, yeah, like, uh, that's probably not what you wanted, but I'm glad you're here, Jack. Um, if you're willing to come forward, that's great. If not, you can just stay where you are, but we want to lift you up in prayer. I don't mean to put you on the spot but it looks like I did. <laughs> Come up here. So just uh, happy he's alive, and they did a CT scan, and his brain's all working good and everything. Uh, so that's, that's good to know. Um, actually, I want to ask anybody that wants to join me uh, to come on up. Let's step down here, buddy. So the right side of his jaw is broken, and he's... Uh, been in pain and they did a nice job stitching up his chin and uh, so we're just going to put him into God's hands together here. Holy Father, thank you so much for your goodness. You knew Jack before he ever took a breath in this world. You knew him, you loved him and, and we are just so thankful that he's a part of our family and Father, we thank you that he's a part of this church and a part of this church family. And Father, we thank you for the gifts that you've blessed him with and just uh, that you have made him a part of your body. And we are so grateful to you that uh, he's not more seriously injured last night. And God, you made our bodies this way. You know every part of our body. You know everything about them. You know exactly what happened, Jack. And you, you can see it all, and you did see it all. And God... We come together as a group of believers in you, and we put Jack into your hands, and we ask for our, the desire of our heart, and that is, God, that you would heal him right now, that you would heal his jaw, that you would make it work properly, that you would heal up his chin, that you would heal up any bruising and hurting that he has, and that, God, that you would just completely heal him right now. And, God, that is our desire that you would just show your power and your glory on him in this very moment. And God, we ask you in all of this that you would do this thing for us, that you would give us the desires of our heart as we look to you together. But we ask not for our own will nor our own desire, but we bring him before you to seek your desire for Jack. And your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than ours. And we always want to be in subjection to you with every request and so, God, we just pray that you would choose the route that you will be most glorified in, in Jack's eyes, that you would be glorified, that you would bless him, that you would heal him, that you would restore him, and that you would just be with him and guide him through all this experience that he's gone through. We thank you for the trials. We thank you that we learn our frailties. We thank you that we learn your greatness and ask you now in Jesus holy name be glorified in Jack please heal him please make him well and just work with him through all of this and we just lay him into your hands and we just trust you holy father that you will do what is best because you are merciful you are compassionate and no one loves Jack more than you do and we trust and believe and rely on your love always and thank you in Jesus holy name Amen. 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 All right, buddy. Oh.
<laughs> All right, well, if you're just joining us uh, today for the first time, we're actually going to continue on a series uh, that we've been going over the last uh, three weeks that I've spoken and uh, here again today, and it's on the spirit of truth. So this is going to be part four of spirit of truth, and we've been talking about the promise that Jesus made that it was to our advantage that he went away, that the spirit of truth would come, the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit would come, and Jesus gave many promises that would be fulfilled by the Holy Spirit. And think about that promise, because he was speaking to people that he had called to be his disciples, who had been following Jesus wherever he went, as he traveled around preaching the gospel, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, showing the powers of the kingdom, showing the gospel of the kingdom. And here they are being told, it's to your advantage that I leave you. And you can think about this relationship and how intimate it was as they walked together, they slept together, they ate together, they prayed together, they ministered together. There was a, a togetherness and an intimacy that Jesus had with his disciples that Jesus wants us to have with the Holy Spirit. Because he said, I will pray the Father, he will send the Spirit, the Spirit will come to us to lead us into all truth, to testify to us of Jesus, and to convict us of sin, to convict us of righteousness, to convict us of judgment, to tell us of things to come, to intercede on our behalf. All the work that the Holy Spirit does, and as we talked about last week, the gifts of the Spirit that the Spirit gives to us to edify the body, all of this work of the Spirit is done through an intimacy between the Holy Spirit and us. So the Father sends the Spirit, Christ sends the Spirit, and we receive the Spirit, and he says, I'm not leaving you orphans. Now, when you think of what it means to be an orphan, you think of the loss of family, right? The loss of the provider, the loss of the protector, the loss of the one who's leading and guiding. And when you think about the impact of an orphan and what it means to be without the guidance of the Father. When you think about that, we might tend to go, well, you know, where's the food coming from? Where's the provision? But I want us to think about the realities that, that go much deeper than just having something to eat and something to drink. The orphan suffers because of the lack of leadership. The orphan suffers because of the lack of someone to train in the way to go. And when Jesus is saying, I'm not leaving you orphans, you realize what he was saying is, I'm giving you the gift of the Holy Spirit to be your teacher, to be your guide. I'm not leaving you alone. And so as we've been thinking through this series about the Holy Spirit and about the promise that Jesus made, what I really want us to do, if we come away from this series just having a deeper appreciation for the absolute need that we all have for God's spirit within us. It says without his spirit, we are not his. That's not just a theoretical, theological thought. That is a reality. And that should be a driving motivator in our lives. As Jesus said, ask for the Holy Spirit. You know, a child asks for bread, will the father give him a stone? If the child asks for fish, will the father give him a serpent? How much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? We can rely on the provision of our father to bless us with the Holy Spirit. We should expect it. We should not ask doubting why I hope I have the Holy Spirit. We should know we live and walk in the Holy Spirit because our Father does not withhold good gifts. And if we find that we are not being led by the Holy Spirit, then ask. Seek. Ask for God to help us because the process of this is not just a matter of whether you have the Spirit or not, but are you being led by the Spirit? Are you walking in the Spirit? Do you have the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit? And that's where the relationship and the intimacy is. Just as Jesus was giving to his disciples, so now the Holy Spirit is giving to his disciples. The leadership, the guiding, and the teaching. That's why he said, it's your, it's your advantage. It's to your advantage that I go away, that the Spirit would come. So turn with me now to Acts chapter 13. Just want to pick this up real quick. We went over this a couple, uh, actually it was maybe last Saturday even. Um, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. In part two, of this series, we talked about 
what happened here where the Spirit spoke and said, Set apart for me Saul and Barnabas. So it was verse 2 of Acts 13. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, uh, Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in uh, Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they also had John as their assistant. So here they go on the, the mission that, that the Spirit had called them to. Now, if you notice this uh, trip, the way it went out, is that the one? Nope, that's trip two. There's trip one. All right, so trip one went out, and basically they went through the region, Saul, Barnabas, and John went with them, and they went out on this trip preaching the gospel in the places where the Spirit had called them to go. So we talked about how awesome that is, that they were praying and fasting, they were ministering to the Lord. Then the Spirit spoke and said, set aside for me Barnabas and Saul and put them on a mission. So what a wonderful thing to realize that what our job is is to minister to the Lord, worshiping him, serving him, fasting, seeking his face, and allow him to lead us. So important in life to look for the leadership you know, if you were with Jesus Christ when he was in the flesh on the earth, wouldn't you look to him for leadership? If you were one of the disciples going around, would you talk to him about, what do I need to do? What is, what is the day? What are we doing today? What's on the agenda? Do you have an agenda that you want to share with me? Am I just following you where you go? Wouldn't you want to ask him about how to minister and how to do things? And don't we see that in the Gospels? That the disciples are saying, how come that demon didn't come out? He said, this kind doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. Why did this happen or this happen? And Jesus was teaching them and telling them, friends, we need to realize that God is asking us to receive of the Holy Spirit by faith and to expect a leading that comes by the Holy Spirit. We should be asking God to lead us, to teach us, to guide us, and to direct us. Because otherwise, this is just theory isn't it? We don't want just theory. I'm not encouraging you to theory. I'm encouraging you to practice, to walk in the Spirit, to expect a leading of the Spirit, and to seek the leading of the Spirit till you receive. And that is what we're pressing into together. That's what we encourage one another to. So Saul and Barnabas went on this trip, and I'll turn with me over to chapter 15. After they returned on this trip, they were together and they were teaching. And notice here, it said in verse 35, Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Verse 36, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, now let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. So that's kind of exciting, isn't it? So here they went out on this trip. The, the Holy Spirit had set them aside. They went out preaching in these regions, making converts, going where the Spirit led them to go. And now Paul's saying, okay, we've been here for a while. Let's go back. Let's circle back through. But notice what happened here. Chapter 15 now, verse 36, or 37. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. And you remember we read that in chapter 13. They took John with them. But as we find in that story, he left during the trip. So notice what Paul says in verse 38. Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So a dispute arises. And notice the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, which was one of the places that Paul and Barnabas had gone on the first trip. It's kind of hard to see there, but Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So you can kind of see where they were. Uh, as you look at Antioch, it's kind of where the red arrow and the blue line begins. 
uh, let's see if I can point that out right here. You can't see that light, can you? So in Antioch, that's where they started. So Barnabas and John went to Cyprus, and Paul went back the way they kind of finished up over there, and, they, and he goes back and starts strengthening the brethren. So they were going to go together. They went separate, but they're going back, and they're doing the work of visiting the places that they had gone before. So now notice this. Then he came to Derby and Lystra. So here we have, um, going back to those maps, this was only in here for Cal, because Cal thought this one looked better. But uh, we, we, we overruled Cal. So, but I wanted that in for Cal, so he'd feel better about it. So we have it in. So when they left Antioch, it went up through Tarsus. You can see they went to Derby, Lystra. They, they started going through the regions where they had finished their trip. And so as you see this here, so they came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium, and Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. So basically, he's going to take that stumbling out of the way. And it's very interesting that this comes on the heels of Acts chapter 15, where they're saying you don't need to be sacrificed or circumcised in the manner of Moses. But now, here Paul is, and why does he do it? Because people knew that he was Greek. So he's removing an obstacle there. And they went through the cities. They delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in faith and increased in numbers daily. Now, when they had gone through uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia, so you can kind of see again as you look up uh, Phrygia and Galatia as they're moving on past uh, on their trip there, Notice what happens. So as, as they move on and they, they come to that region, when they had uh, passed the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Now, you might say, are, is, are you ever forbidden to preach the word? And what's so interesting is here we have record that they were forbidden to go to that place and preach the word of God. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is we can have a lot of good ideas, but are they what God wants us to do? There are many callings. There's many administrations. As we read uh, last Sunday in, in 1 Corinthians 12, there's many activities. Right? Not everybody has the same activity. Not everybody has the same calling. And one of the things as a body that we need to appreciate about one another is that we've all been called to different things. Just because God calls you to evangelism doesn't mean everybody's an evangelist. Because God calls some to be pastors doesn't mean everybody's a pastor. Because some people are called to administrative gifts doesn't mean everybody's an administrator. Not everybody has the same gifts by design. Like the human body, every part has a function. Every part does it share. You're being encouraged here to walk in fulfillment of your calling, to seek the face of the Lord for what he would have you do and what role he would have you play. So if he wants you to be an ear, be the ear. If he wants you to be the tongue, be the tongue. If he wants you to be feet, hands, whatever it is, whatever the Lord calls you to, whether parts seen or parts unseen, you know, you could say, hey, some of the most valuable parts are the things you don't see about me, right? What's going on in my brain and in my heart and my digestive system? Those parts aren't seen openly, but yet, wow, they make things work. And you realize that in the body, you need to fulfill your role. We're encouraging you to come to seek the Lord's face, to know what to do, to realize that you've been called to have a communion with the Holy Spirit that goes beyond theology and doctrinal positions and theories and intellectual practices to an actual walk with the Holy Spirit. And if we're not walking with the Holy Spirit, then what are we doing? Because as it said, everything else can become vanity. 1 Corinthians 13, though I give speak with tongues of men and of angels, though I have prophecies, though I have knowledge, though I give my body to be burned, though I give all my stuff to the poor. But if I have not love, I am nothing. The Holy Spirit is the way God imparts love. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, right? Romans 5, 5. So when we think about 
walking with the Spirit, all of this should be coming out of a spirit of love and the fruit of the Holy Spirit being produced for whatever ministry we have. But in this case, the Spirit said no. I want you to notice, because sometimes people think, well, you know, I just don't hear from the Holy Spirit because they're not hearing moment by moment and breath by breath. Did Saul and Barnabas hear from the Holy Spirit? Do we have evidence of that? Well, then why did they have a contention and disagree? Why did they have a dispute so sharp they didn't go together? Because sometimes I think we think that in every circumstance and in every way, there's an intervention that's taking place to make sure that this is all working just smoothly. And maybe that's exactly what the Spirit wanted. See, we can look at what happened in their contention. We don't know what exactly was said. Barnabas wanted to take John. Paul didn't. Paul had a reason. I assume Barnabas had a reason. They both felt convicted of what to do. They both wanted to do the ministry of the Lord. They didn't agree, and they didn't go forward. I don't know if that was of the spirit or of the flesh, but I know that God can make all things work together for good. And I also know that it doesn't appear that the spirit said, take him or don't take him. The reason I'm bringing this up is because sometimes we must reason with what we understand with one another. And so if you're saying, well, I never hear from the Holy Spirit because you haven't gotten an answer to something in particular, it doesn't appear Paul and Barnabas did at this point. So I'm bringing that to your attention to ponder. Don't judge it. Think about it. Think about it. But now in this case, as Paul is going out, he's going out to the places where they had gone, he gets to a point what is happening? The Spirit is per, per, not permitting them to go into this region. They're forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now see what's so beautiful about this is the assumption is when they, were, they knew they were forbidden, that he didn't go. Was the ministry being led by the Spirit? Appears so. Because the Spirit said don't go, they didn't go. So also my point, when this ministry started out, it was Paul that said, Barnabas, let's go back. You know, woo going on a trip together. Let's do it. Seems there was agreement, but then they couldn't agree on John. So they didn't go together. But that didn't mean that Paul wasn't going by the Spirit. We, we don't know about Barnabas, but I would assume, we, we shouldn't assume that he wasn't going by the Spirit too. Because these two men were loved by God, they were called by God, and they were going to places where God had sent them to preach. Okay? So I want us to see the realities of this walk. Because if you think it's a 100 percenter kind of a thing, for Paul and Barnabas it wasn't a 100 percenter kind of thing. But as they went in ministry, they were looking to the leading of the Spirit, and the Spirit was leading. So they'd come to that place and they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now notice this. So you can kind of see on this map, it, there's the province of Asia kind of on the, uh, the left, west side of the screen there. As they go up, they weren't able to go there. So now they're coming up to Mycenae, and they want to go into uh, Bithynia. And notice what it says here. So after they had come to Mycenae, verse 7, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So again, how did that look? I don't know. Did they hear a voice? Did they understand? They were praying. They're like, no, I'm troubled in my spirit. No, we're not supposed to go there. I just know. I don't know. It doesn't say. But they knew they were not permitted to go. So what does it say? They didn't go. So passing by Mycenae, they came to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Do you see how beautiful this is? And do you see the patience that is required that as they're continuing a journey, they want to go in a place? Nope. So they keep moving on. They want to go into another place? Bithynia? Nope. They pass by Mycenae. They're looking for leading, but they didn't know exactly where they were going. 
And you know, a lot of ministry is like that. When, when God called uh, me to, to ministry, I didn't know exactly what was going to happen. I knew I was coming to California, but I didn't know what it was going to look like or where it was going to go. And I had been told that I, I would be going into a, a desert kind of period of time, as I shared with you a few weeks ago. And I didn't know exactly where that would lead or how that would take. But when events took place and we had uh, been sponsored in, in doing a radio ministry, as we prayed about renewing that, I knew the time for that had ended. Three years we had preached on the radio, it was done. I knew in my spirit through prayer that was done, and now it's time to go face-to-face. And when we went face-to-face, well, I thought it was going to work a certain way. And that way didn't work. I had been, uh, Scott and I had both been uh, raised up as elders in a group, and from the, from the start, I was thinking this was how it's going to start. Nope, that's not how it's going to start. And it was a failure from the get-go. So, praying more, knowing what to do, saying, I know that God is calling me to start a church here in Lake Elsinore. And God said, this is what we're going to do. And we shared with Scott and Carolyn, and immediately... They're like, if that's what you're going to do, we're going to do it. They were living in Orange County. And so they had to drive to Lake Elsinore because we knew that's where we were, we were going to plant the church. And it began in the family room. And we began praying about this church. And what's cool is Brainard and Brenda, who are not here today, they live in that house now. <laughs> I know, that's crazy, isn't it? Ask them about it sometime, it's cool. So they came to this church, and they live in the house where Rock Valley started. (laughs) But in that process, I can tell you of the level of, I don't know what to do. Uh, It was a deep level of, all we know is to follow. Didn't see this church in the makings. Didn't see you people in the makings of coming together as a fellowship didn't see exactly. All we knew was we're praying and we're seeking. And that was what a lot of the beginning of Rock Valley was, praying and seeking. And you think you're called to do something. It's like, what's, you know, this should be just starting to flow along because God's behind it. And you know, it, it didn't move at the speed that I imagined. It didn't move much at all, it seemed, by my eyes. But you realize That in the process, as I look back now and say, when we started in 2005 and, you know, so many beautiful and fun times, and uh, I won't share, Scott, but so many fun times praying together at at the house and about the church, and, um, you know, those were so healthy to know that you were called to something and having no idea what to do, to know that you were supposed to do something but didn't know how to go about it. Because it was the I don't know that made us hungry and desperate and desirous for God to lead it and to do whatever he wanted to do. And I still feel like that today, and I know the Sharpens feel that way too. It's, you just feel a holy desperation that I don't know what this is. I'm available. Whatever comes, it's from you. Whatever, Whoever we can serve, whoever we can minister to, great we become available to God, but it's up to God to do what he wants to do. We don't have a, a, a business campaign. And when we started, and I started going to some pastor meetings, everybody was giving me the, you know, this is the way you do it. This is the way you build it. And I started reading, I'm like, well, I, I run a business, and this looks just like that. But this is not a business. This is his business. And his business runs differently than man's business. And ultimately, We discovered, and as I've shared with you in this series already, I learned early on, and I continue to believe today, the most important thing I can do as a pastor is seek the Lord's face. That's the number one thing. Fasting, praying, seeking. I don't have to try to gather up a flock. He will lead whoever will come, and we can be brothers together working under the will of God of the Lord by the Holy Spirit. And so as a church, 
when you come here, I hope you're not coming to say, well, I come just to hear the message. These messages are given to encourage you to be engaged in the body of Christ. And there are those among you who will be called to be some apostles and some evangelists and some prophets and some pastors and some teachers. And I expect that. I desire that. I pray for that for this group because ultimately we need God to raise up people who are willing to give of their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ to go about preaching Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead and to go around as we read in the book of Acts. The, the, the mission for the church is the same as it's always been, and the means to do it is the same, praying, fasting, seeking him, and looking for the leadership and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Do you agree with that? So we all then, in faithfulness to God together, should be encouraging one another to this end. It's not just about showing up. It's about engaging in seeking the Lord. And most of that happens when you're not here, when you're getting up early to pray, when you're staying up late to pray, when you're carving out prime times. Instead of turning TV on at 7, 8, or getting on Facebook, you know, you're getting with the face that you need to seek. Because I'll tell you what, if you want to be connected, there's no way to get connected with everybody in this world faster than going to the Lord God Almighty. He is connected to everyone. You only need to know one to be connected. Because ultimately, he will bring about everything we need. So never forget that. It's not about who you know on this earth. It's about who you know in heaven. And it's about knowing where to go as led by the Spirit of God. And God said, I'm not leaving you orphans. See, that should be so comforting to us, and we should be so dependent on that. But what happens is we grow up learning to live life and navigate the waters seemingly alone. And most of us here find ourselves saying, yep, I have navigated many waters alone. I have done what I thought was right. I did what was right in my own eyes. And that can be a very messed up thing. Even in our prayers, He says, you have not because you ask not, that's messed up, but you don't receive when you ask because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. It's just what you want. Are we pursuing the glory of the Lord? Are we pursuing who he is, what he wants? Do we agree his ways are higher than our ways? His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He knows exactly where to be and what to do. And that's what's so beautiful here in this story is that they were being told, don't do this and don't do that. And for us in in this church, it was don't do this, don't do that. And the way it happened, I can tell you, we were like, well, God, are we hearing you right? Do you want us to continue on or not? Because when we were showing up and it's nine people and then the Kimberleys come in and it's 11 people and then, you know, we have visitors, but people weren't staying. There were 11 people and then... We were at the front of the church one day, I gotta tell the story. So Carolyn and Stephanie and I, I don't remember if you were standing right with us, Scott, but there were only, you know, so many adults there. And we're like, God, give us some encouragement. Like, would you please, please just give us some encouragement that we're doing this. Send somebody else that we know that we're gonna keep going on in this whole thing that you're calling us to do, but we're we're not seeing evidence. We've been at this for, you know, over a year now, and the door pops open, and Greg Beagle walks in and says, the Beagles have arrived. (laughs) Right, was that it? The Beagles have arrived. The Beagles have arrived, and they're still here. They arrived and they stayed. And I'll tell you what, it was just, I mean, inside I was just dying laughing, it was like, Wow, like even the pronouncement was like, I, okay, the Beagles are here because that's what we were praying for. We wanted someone else to arrive to help in the work and what faithful servants Greg and Lynn have been. Thank you so much for your service. And I know that they're being here was spirit-led because they couldn't tell us enough the first time they came, we're not looking for a church. We are not looking for a church. We're in home fellowship. We're just here visiting. Don't get your hopes up. And, you know, why would we? We're just such small, but we were so excited because they were there, and we were just such a small 
little fellowship. And, uh, and again, when the Kemmerleys came in, we're like, why would anybody want to stay? But you know what? From the first week, they've been every week. And when they're not here, they've always let us know. And what a wonderful thing is. And so people like the Kemmerleys coming in, they will always hold a special place in our heart. Because at a time when we needed a little bit of encouragement, they were the source of that encouragement to us. And, and they helped us to continue on. But ultimately learning about people. This church has been built on a culture the way God set it up. It happened in the time the way God set it up. And what it did was continually make us realize this is not us. The work of man can only go so far. But if it's a work of man to build a church, if it's just a business model, if it's just an enticement, if it's just an allurement, well, what is that? See, it is God's spirit that has always been leading the church and growing the church and giving gifts to each one as he wills for the edification of the church and the growth of the body, and it must always be that way. And as a church, no matter what activity, no matter what group, no matter what we do, we must always be engaged in realizing this is a work of God by the Holy Spirit, and we need you, God. That should always be at the heart of everything we do. I need you. I don't... Young people, if you're looking for a spouse, go to God. Don't, you don't need to go to a bar. You don't need to go out. Look, go to God. He is connected to every person. He can bring everybody you need into your life. You realize how powerful the God that we serve is. He knows everybody. He can talk to everybody. He can direct everybody. We need to go to God. You want to see more people come here? You want to find your ministry? Go to God. Because ultimately, he's the only one. And there is no substitute for that. I cannot seek the Lord for you. You cannot seek the Lord for me. I can pray for you, and I hope that you're praying for me because I need your prayers. And I want to pray for you. Our ministry to one another is to continually pray for one another, but ultimately the seeking, you've got to do it. To lay down your life to the Lord and to be obedient when he speaks. And so they were told not to do this. So notice, so passing by my sea of verse 8, they came to Troas. The vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after they had seen the vision, immediately, don't you love that? The word immediately. They, they understood immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. A couple weeks ago, I was talking about calling. Calling is so powerful because when you do the thing God called you to do, you don't quit. Now, I'm going to give a disclaimer. Make sure it's the voice of the Lord and not the voice of your own heart. Because you can go on a lot of vain works thinking, God inspired me to do this. God wanted me to do this. I would test it to make sure that you're hearing from him and not just the whim of your own heart. Hearts are very deceitful. So you press in. I told you before I went to Argentina, I tested that word seven times because I wanted to make sure it wasn't a whim. So I needed information that I couldn't have known, and that's what I received before I went. I needed to know it was from God giving me information I did not have on my own, and then I went. Friends, you do what you need to in your relationship with God. Understand God loves you and wants to lead you and guide you in the way. He's not a harsh God. But he's looking for us to come to him for the leadership. But the thing is, when we went long periods of time and we didn't see the encouragement of people or we were doing the things and preaching to groups of, you know, 12 and 15 and, you know, small groups and just wondering what's happening. God, do you, is, are you sure you want us to be doing this? And the thing is, I never thought about giving up unless the Lord said give up because I knew where the calling came from. And that's what's beautiful about calling. Scott had told me a statistic that many pastors who start to build churches that are, do it, a lot of them quit within the first, what is it, two years or five years? Five. Within the first five years. And for us, it, it, it wasn't an option. Never felt it was an option to quit. And 
ultimately, we are just to be available to God no matter what we see. If you know you're doing what he wants, that's where you want to be. So notice what happened here. They immediately sought to go. They received a calling. It wasn't just a desire. Now they were told where to go. See, that's the easiest thing, isn't it? If you knew God said, Linda, go here, you're going to go, right? Cal, you're going with her, <laughs> right? You're going to go. You go and do the work that you've been called to do. So therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. So you can see on the map where Galatia is, then to Asia, Mycenae, they wanted to go up north there to Bithynia. Nope, nope. So they went to Troas, got it, and made a straight course to get over to Macedonia and to go right to the center of Macedonia to Philippi. So beautiful, right? Looks good. So, verse 13, And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us, and she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Now, isn't that beautiful? They were there. They got directed. They went to a place. They went out on the Sabbath. They knew people were there praying, and they preached the word, and her heart was so ready. And see, that's what's so cool about this. There was direction. There was a heart ready, and they were out there with Lydia at this place where prayer was made on the Sabbath. So here they go, and so she heeded her heart to heed the things spoken. The Lord opened her heart. And see, again, when we go out, we do the work, but then we look for the Lord to do the work because the word gets planted where he's been working. That's where there can be success in a planting. He's got to open the heart. We don't do this. He does this. And so we, we're desirous for him to bless that work. So when she and her household, verse 15, were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. They brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them, uh, to keep them securely. And having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. The Spirit didn't let them go into Asia. Didn't let them go into Bithynia. Had them pass by Mycenae. Brings them to a place for Lydia. And now this? This is what you wanted, God? This is what you wanted? That we would be falsely accused, that we would have our clothes stripped of us, that we would be beaten with many stripes, that we would be brought to jail. And not only that, but they're going to put us in irons, securing us in the center of that prison, being bound up. Now, friends, sometimes the callings of the Lord to our own minds, it doesn't, that, this is what you wanted? You won't let me go other places, but you want me to go here, and now this is what happens? See, God is just an amazing God. And so often we humanly want to evaluate the success 
of what God is leading us to do with our own eyes. I encourage you to read Hebrews 11 because it ends so beautifully in the hall of faith that God says of people who they overcame armies, they overcame sword, they overcame peril, they overcame by faith. And also by faith, some were sawn in two, some were martyred, some were beaten, some were stoned, right? The, the evaluation of truth wasn't what we humanly would say. How often do we humanly look for the result? And see, that is one of the beautiful things that God teaches us through patience, through waiting on him. You don't need to be concerned about the result. My work is in you. What is the work of God? That you would believe in him who he sent. Do you realize that's the work? And as we engage as part of the body, that work doesn't change. In fact, it becomes more acute that you see, I need you. I'm relying on you. I'm trusting in you. I'm believing in you that you will show me where to go and you will give me what I need to go there. That you will back me up. That you will bless me the way you want it to be done. And I will not evaluate it by what I see. Because as prophets of old that went, as Jesus said, he sent the prophets and what did they do? They killed them. Jesus himself was falsely accused, beaten, scourged, mocked, and crucified. Was that a sign of a lack of success? Or was it perfect success for you and me and everyone who believes in him? You see, we can't evaluate it by our eyes. We need to evaluate it by his will and direction. And where we go in the spirit is to say, when the spirit says, go, go. And when the spirit says, don't go, don't go. And you're saying, well, I don't know where they're go or don't go. Then seek. See, this is where we have to be as a body of believers, seeking the will of the Lord, seeking his desire. What can I do to please you? Give me appointments today. And when I go, if you give me opportunity to speak the gospel, give me the words to say. And if I have an opportunity, I see somebody hurting, help me to minister to them today. Make me available. Show me how to be available. And give me eyes to see when somebody has a need. That I'd be aware of it. That I would be alert to it. You see, we all go out. When we leave this church, we go out. We go in many different directions. And all of us should be going out into the world with the spirit of God and the encouragement to know God, wherever you want me to be, however you want me to serve, whatever you want me to do, I'm available to you. So whether you're at your job or in your neighborhood, it doesn't matter. You could be in your house. You could be out on a date with your spouse or with your boyfriend or girlfriend or just hanging out with friends. Be available for God. Don't make so many plans that you can't fit God into the picture. Because when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, he said, this is what real love is, to love your neighbor. He used the example of people so busy they couldn't stop to serve somebody else. And I would challenge you, if you are so busy in your life that you only have time for your work or your schooling or your learning or your uh, games or your entertainments or whatever, and God's getting shortchanged, reorganize. Sometimes you have to just die to that life and say, I got to start it anew, God, burn it down, let's build it again. Because you've got to sometimes go back to the beginning and say, why am I here? What is my life about? If I am not here because God put me here, then why am I here? But if I am here because he put me here, do I believe? And the work of belief is something that happens through the word and understanding, through the spirit and believing, and the growing close in an intimacy with God, and then all this stuff kind of just happens. It kind of takes place because he is first. We're looking to him. We're trusting in him. We're, we're looking to say, God, I want you in every way of my life, and I don't want to be a part. And so the game night can become a Bible study night. It can become a prayer night. You could gather for one purpose and do something completely different because you're allowing for the Holy Spirit to say, I don't permit you to do that. This is what we're going to do. And this will change your life in a beautiful and amazing way. But we have to be open to God. We have to be open to the leading. And we need to look to please him. So now they're in the place where the spirit led them. Was there any doubt in their minds that they were supposed to go to Macedonia? When they got there, they had success. Paul cast out the demon, and it made the worldly people angry. 
What happens when worldly people get angry? Hate. False accusations. You see it in the news all the time. That when people get angry, they falsely accuse a lot. Okay? Don't be surprised when it happens to you. In fact, be concerned if it's not. If everybody thinks so well of you, be concerned, Jesus said. Because ultimately, the more good you do, the more you're going to get punished for it. And that's a part of life. So, now they're in prison. They're in jail. Notice what, how they respond to this. So they're in the stocks. Their hands, their feet, it says, uh, fasten their feet in the stocks, verse 24. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They were saying, God, why did you allow this? This isn't a picture of whining and complaining, is it? They knew what they were supposed to do. They were where they were supposed to be in that moment because where were they supposed to be? If God gives you breath, be in his presence. They're in prison, and instead of being depressed, they're praising God. Friends, if you find yourself in a place of depression, heartache, low places, the way to come out of that is by getting your mind off yourself and get your mind onto God. Stop whining about where you are and start praising about who he is and enter into his presence because it's like you become a Teflon human being. It just doesn't mean as much anymore when people do these things because I'm expecting it. Just like Jesus told me, I'm expecting it. It's not all going to be. But how do you get peace in your life? By praising and thanking the God who gives peace and life. So praise him. So here they are praising. And suddenly a great earthquake, verse 26, uh, happened so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. So kind of a supernatural quaking, right? And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing that all the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He's like, I, everybody's gone. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, we're all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How did that happen? How did the jailer come to a point where he was in such a place that he would ask a simple question? What do I need to do to be saved? I mean, is that sweet? But what did it require? It required the, the people to get mad. It required the magistrates to judge them harshly. It required that they be put in a prison and not just put in a prison, but told the jailer, you lock them up securely, right? So there, he was under the pressure of what the magistrates are saying, don't let these guys go. They become loosed, but they stay, and they say, don't harm yourself. They didn't look to harm the jailer. They were there. We're still here. And the jailer is now ready. Friends, that's probably not the way you and I would orchestrate it if we were doing it. That's why I said his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Sometimes we have to go through things in order to serve other people. But what if they would have been like, this stinks. I hate being in here. We're locked up. This is awful. Earthquake happens. I'm out of here. You know, and just ditching, Right? 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 Have you ever found yourself in a place like that? Maybe not in a prison, but feeling like you were in a prison, feeling like you were going through a tribulation, your attitude turns sour, God's not in the picture, you start taking things into your own hands, and the opportunity comes and you're gone. But see, it was because they weren't gone, because they were in a mind before the Lord, and because they're praising him, sowing to heavenly places. What's the Lord doing? working something. This is what we as a body of believers should be engaged in. Lord, do your work. If I need to be in prison or beaten for the glory of the Lord, you got to do your work. I would rather spend my life with more hardship to the glory of the Lord than to have more ease and comfort 
and come to a place and say, well, David, I could have done more in your life if you would have submitted to that and praised me through it. It's better to go through it. It's better to go through it. Come what may, I praise you. Come what may, I serve you. Jesus said, unless you're willing to take up your cross daily and follow me, you're not worthy of me. See, that's what he's meaning. You've got to be willing to go through things for his glory. It didn't look good. God made it great. That's the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. Every time you feel it, when you're raising your kids and it gets tough, when you're going through your marital issues, when you're going through problems, you've got financial hardships, you've got health hardships, praise him. Maybe it's the health problem that you have that takes you to a hospital is where you're going to minister to somebody who will come to the Lord. You just don't know. See, this is, this is the thing. It requires what? A patient walk of faith. A patient walk of faith. God, I don't like where I am. Thank you that I am where I am because I know you make me different through it. I don't want to let this trial go. I don't want to let this seeming misfortune come upon me without appreciating who my God is. And if I can in any way be used for your glory through this, let it be so, so that your witness can be a thing of beauty. You have to set your mind to this, that you will follow the will of the Lord and set your mind on him through praying and through singing hymns and worshiping him. And as he said here, what should we do? What can I do? to be saved, verse 30. Verse 31, so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. That is, the jailer, they were there with all their beating, put in the things, that they were still in the pain and the the problems of being beaten and and, and, uh, whipped and here he is washing them and immediately he and all his family were baptized and when they brought them into the house he set food before them and he rejoiced and having believed in God with all his household and when it was day the magistrate sent officers saying let those men go now isn't that interesting why did they say hold them securely and then they go through all this in the night and then the next day let them go how did that happen why did it happen that way It seems a little odd, doesn't it? They were there for a reason. God used the reason. When the reason was done, he took them out of that. The the, the suffering was was done. They were told to let go. And notice what he said. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. And I just think this is cool, because Paul's messing with them now. He's like, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly uncondemned Romans and have thrown us into prison. Now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed, let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison. They entered the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So the point of all this is, brethren, we need to be looking to God. We need to be expecting the leading of God. We need to be listening and asking the questions. Ask what to do. And as God leads you, do it. And if you're unsure, continue to follow the ways of the Lord. As you know them with a good conscience before him, seeking to do good, seeking to be available, and continuing to listen if he guides you in a different direction. Know that that's what we learn from Paul here. I want you to think about and meditate on these things. I want you to come to a deeper intimacy with the Lord. And friends, all of this only makes sense if we come to a deeper intimacy, that we walk in, whether together or apart from each other, seeking the face of the Lord in the way that he would lead us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, glorious God, you who blessed us with your son and spoke to us through your son in these last days, You promise through him to give us of the Holy Spirit. We desire your spirit in us. We desire to be led by you and guided by you. We desire that you would bless us in the way that you would have us to go. We desire that you would shake us in our lives 
that we would be found in you doing your will and your good pleasure. Help us to be purified before you. Forgive us for every false idol in our hearts. Forgive us for creating a false image of you in our hearts. Forgive us for taking your name in vain. Forgive us for not bringing you honor and glory. We look to submit to you now. Please forgive us for all the ways in which we do not submit to you. Please forgive us for hardening our hearts, for closing off our ears to hear from you. Forgive us for any pride and arrogant that it, arrogance that is in our hearts and cause us just to see how wonderful it is when we submit our lives to you, when we seek for your leading and for your guidance and through whatever wonderful, joyous time or even through the hard times that we would constantly be praying to you, praising you, and bringing you glory, knowing that you work all things together for good to those who love you and are called according to your purposes. And we know we're only here because we are called according to your purposes. And we are here because we love you and we want you to lead us and guide us. Bless us with a spirit of love and joy and peace and long-suffering. Give us every gift that we need and please, God, let us see the way to you and the way to walk in this world, apart from this world, giving glory to you. Pour out your glory on your children. Pour out your presence. Be manifest in your glory and presence among us, and let it be a witness and a sign through this world that others may come to see they need to be saved, that they may ask us, how is it that we be saved? And that, God, you would bless us with the answers. You would bless us with the heart to love and to baptize and to teach the way of our Lord and Savior more perfectly to them. Oh, Father, Father, let these words not fall to the ground, but let no word, none of this prayer fall to the ground, but raise it up, answer it, Open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on your people. We seek to have you, God, not for our own glory. We want you to be glorified here. And we want people to know you more. We praise you and thank you and ask for your blessing, not just on us here, but on all those who believe in you around this world, that you would give us purified hearts to seek you. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.